Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, everyone uh, that is on the phone and coming in through um, this webinar, it looks like we got a bunch of you on there. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to attend. And I pressed the wrong button. So I'm going to just fix my thing here. Uh, thank you all for. Oh, I'm going to fix this there. Screen share participants. I pressed the wrong button on mine, but we'll just go ahead there. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, artifacts to a lot of the people that are using QuickBooks Online. Um, currently, as a business well manager here at Intuit, um, my role is to work with accounting firms that have generally 10 plus staff. Um, I've been working in this area for the last seven or eight months and as I've been going around from firm to firm uh, interviewing accountants and uh, usually accountants and bookkeepers um, to things that we can help them out with uh, one of the topics that came up uh, was dealing with the time uh, consume and efforts put it forward to uh, small business clients that happen to have uh, investments and maybe portfolios of investments so I recalled uh, that I got to meet uh, a guy down in, um, at our QB Connect Toronto event and uh, we had a great conversation and so I followed up with him after I heard about four or five different firms mention this um, as a hot point that they would like to solve. Um, uh, he went through his product and I was absolutely blown away by what you're going to see today uh, and how it works and how many hours it can generally save the most of you. So I took it upon myself to um, send out an email to the list of people that are using QuickBooks Online in Alberta. And um, here we are today uh, about to watch uh, Guy present to us. Um, do you want to kick it off, Guy? Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. First of all, I'll introduce, I have two colleagues with me today, uh, members of the team. I have Jason Addis and uh, NG. So they'll be joining me on the presentation today. So we'll be, be able to be sure to answer any and all questions. I'd like to first and foremost thank our, our partners, uh, QuickBooks, for uh, encouraging us in our, in our go to market. And uh, very excited by the partnership and what it's brought to us today, all the uh, collaboration that we've been able to do, and today's just another example of that. Uh, so, artifacts, what do we do? At a very high level, what we do is we help accountants save time. Uh, we automate something called investment tracking, which we know has been a, a painful uh, issue for many years in, in the industry. Uh, how did we get here? And so, Artifacts is a spin off of another company called Index Systems, which has been around for approximately 17 years. Index built a back end wealth management software application used by independent brokers uh, across North America, approximately $130 or $140 billion worth of assets managed in that application. And all of these things uh, sometimes happen. Uh, in speaking with its own accountants uh, about some early technology that was built about three years ago, there was this epiphany that there could be an opportunity to commercialize uh, this part of the application, but for a, a different industry leveraging the same information, which is accountants. So we went out and spoke with uh, hundreds of accountants, many different firms, some early adopters, and we proceeded to build out investment accounting software uh, so that we could respect the business processes accountants uh, use to track and reconcile investments. Uh, and essentially, it, it falls into three uh, steps of, of, of the application and three ways that accountants work today is how do you get data? What are the tools that you need to modify, adjust, deal with any backdating issues, uh, any changes in the data? And then how do you reconcile? So those steps in generating the, the classic set of reports. Uh, the founder of Index is an old friend of mine and he invited me to get into this uh, project. I've done uh, commercialization, um, early technology companies as part of my career path. So it sort of made sense for me to get involved. So that's what I'm doing here. So that's, that's a little introduction to the uh, application and to our company. 
we are going to share our screen with you and dive right into our presentation. So again, what we're going to show you today is, is the three main parts of working in our application so, so that the, the steps are clear. We'll stop along the way a couple of times and see if there are any questions. And we will also check the chat box to see if anybody has uh, any questions uh, while we're presenting. All right, so what we're looking at here is a completely empty portfolio. There are no assets, there's no accounts which are linked to it, there's no nothing of any kind in this. So we're going to go into our uh, data uh, management hub, okay, and so there's a couple of different ways to get data into our application. Of course, there's a, a manual way to track non-marketable securities in case you want that represented in your client's portfolio. So a piece of real estate where you're tracking the income, you could create the asset here and keep it as part of the, the portfolio, the, the assets that you're tracking from the client. Third-party account uploads. This is where we support uh, hundreds and hundreds of online investment portals for data download. So it says uh, we've built an encrypted interface which uh, a client using their same logon credentials for their online investment portal, along with answering any security questions, can create a link between your database in our application and their online investment uh, portfolio website and be able to download all the transactions into uh, your database. The third one is statement upload management, and this is where we support PDF documents for conversion, recognition and conversion into our application. So that's a third way of bringing data into the application. It's important to note that when we speak to PDF documents, we don't mean paper that's been converted to PDF. We do mean the PDF documents which are available from the broker or easily downloadable from the website, okay? So we'll start there. All right, we'll choose the, the statement on our on our network. We'll tell the application what month and year it is, along with what language there is to uh, to recognize. And in this period of time when we were converting the data, this would be the amount of time normally set aside to actually enter data into the application. Into, into a spreadsheet, which is how you're probably working today, either in write-up or, or in uh, a sophisticated model in Excel. You see that our application recognizes the statement as a CIBC Wood Gundy statement. It's a monthly statement. We're the ones entering it today when it was entered, and it's recognized it as a text-based document, which means it's not paper converted to PDF, which is actually an image of the data. And now we're reading. So in that time, we're, we're able, we were able to convert the data. Let's go have a look at it. All right. Now, if you want to think about what we've done, okay, all statements are tracking the same information. They all have account numbers, they all have activities, and they all have the positions that are being tracked in the portfolio along with the book values and the market values for each of the accounts that are linked to the statement. Uh, except they all lay them out differently. They all use different words to uh, describe activities. The word dividend might be written D-I-V, D-I-V-E-N-D, with an S uh, in French, and so on and so forth. But it all means the same thing. What we've developed is a standardized way of reading the information and then linking it with the activity types in our library so that later on you can do the calculations that are necessary to calculate gains and losses and uh, foreign asset declarations and so on and so forth. Okay, so if we look at this statement, if, you, if this was uh, you were working at your desk, you could stretch the two across uh, uh, separate screens. So you'd have your statements on your right and the, and the data on your left, and you can see if we pan over on the, on in the statement that you're able to uh, see lots more information in the columns. Just to show you that we're pulling all this data out. So it's, a, it's a 
it's really a complete conversion of the data that we pull from the account. Okay? In this particular statement, you see that there are six accounts which are linked to it. You have five Canadian and one US. All right, if there were seven or eight accounts that were linked to it, we could also we would also be picking them all up there. A word about US exchange rates. We use the Bank of Canada's daily average rate. Uh, for the date of the transaction. That's the universal exchange rate in our application. You are, are, of course, able to modify it. And should it be modified, let's say the client had sold a security in the morning at 10 o'clock and the exchange rate was more favorable to her, you'd be able to go into the bat to modify the exchange rate to uh, accommodate the, the actual exchange rate at that moment in time. And everything is tracked in the back end of the application. There's a full audit trail. So who did it, what they changed it from, what they changed it to, and when they did it. A note is placed in the application, so this is also available for other users to see what they did. And on the back end, it's locked. It's not modifiable by, by the firm or the users. Okay. If we start to uh, look a little bit further down, we see all the positions on the, in the, that are held in the account. And again, every field on the left-hand side is modifiable if we need to change an asset class. Uh, that's easily done. If we need to add a security or remove a security or add an activity or remove an activity, all of this can be done with just a few clicks. Okay. You see, we also have the cost basis and the market value for each one of the accounts that are linked to the portfolio. Okay. Now, we know oftentimes the book costs are wrong, that they're not being correctly tracked by the broker. So, from a process point of view of putting a client in our application, this is how you have to envision it. You need to take the last month of the previous fiscal year. So let's say we're talking about calendar. You load that statement into the application, the December of the year before. Then you modify or validate all of the cost basis for the securities at that time. And then you begin to load your next month's worth of data. At this point, when we're bringing in those next 12 months, We'll recognize the cost basis, but once it's been modified in the application, we'll ignore it. So it will always be uh, ignored at this step, and what's in the application, what's been validated in the application, will be maintained. We're also able to track the cost basis for a security in Canadian and in US with the effective exchange rate, and also generate all your reports in the home currency uh, of the account as well. Okay, so let's go back up and start to. Oh, uh, I have a question. And we have a question. All right. Just give me the chance to come up. How far back in time does the application pull information from? Is it just per upload, or can you upload data from all months available in the accounts? That's a question from Donna Zachary. Uh, to respond to your question, Donna, it's all based on how much data you put into the application. So if you want to load, back statements to have a couple years worth of history, there's no limitation, so long as you have the uh, original PDFs to upload into the application. Typically what, what clients ask us is, how do we get to the opening values? And the way to get to the opening values is to load the last month of the previous fiscal year and then modify the book cost so you, you can be able to start your tracking from that. Let's go back up to the activities. If we have a look on the screen, you see that all of the activity types are written in red. This is because it's the first time that this database, your database, is seeing a CIBC statement. And what you need to do is you need to create a link between the activity types from CIBC in the database. So we configure these activity types and we link them to our standardized library in this search for what some people call singularity, a way to have a harmonized look and of, of, of view of all of the information in one place. And this is done with some machine learning done in the background. All right, so let's configure the activity type. We know a dividend is, a, we're gonna keep the description, it's dividend reinvestment, and we're gonna keep the description for the statement so that the next time a CIBC statement is loaded into the application, you no longer need to configure it. So when we click yes, all of them turn to black. And similarly, as we begin to configure each of the activities, 
So you can imagine that after loading three months of statements into your database from one financial institution, there's virtually no uh, work to do at this step to configure activity types as you increase the number of institutions, there's even less work to do. So the time savings associated with using the application increases over time. And so when you are using PDF statements in, our, in the application, once an account is set up, so you've got your opening values, you've got your previous year of the last fiscal, the previous month of the last fiscal year, you've got your opening values, and now you're starting to load your 12 months of data. You're going to save at least 50% of the time or more if you're, then, if you're using your current methodologies, which is either write-up or JAZIT or uh, Excel spreadsheets, however you're doing to do this today. As a best practice, what we recommend is, where possible, moving towards the online portals. So if you're using an online portal in the first year, Let's say you were to start a download on September the 1st, we could go back in time on the client's website, usually 30 days, but as much as 90 days. You load the rest of the fiscal year, the previous part, uh, using PDF statements, and then going forward, we're collecting data. So this step of configuring activity types is completely skipped. So in year two, where you're collecting only data from the web, which by the way, each month will also fetch the PDF statement and attach it to the client's account, you can look forward to a time savings of over 80 or close to 90% because all of the work done to configure, to set up the account is already done and all the, the data is being fed into the client's account automatically. And we're gonna show you what that looks like in a couple of minutes. At the very top, we showed you some messages. So over time, we've started to learn what it is that uh, may, may be challenging to users or things that we need to flag for users that they bring it into the application. In this particular case, we noticed a, a message that says that the equation for fixed income securities is wrong on these, on these statements. We know that accountants need to track accrued interest separately, so we're just flagging it for you and letting you know that we picked that up but that when we push data into the application, the accrued interest will be tracked on its own, okay? So that's information which you cannot uh, clear that message because that's one that's a, it's a permanent one. But the other message which says you need to clear the activity types, well, we just validated all the activities. So if we click validate at the bottom of the screen, that message will disappear, okay? If for some reason you get interrupted in your work, you're able to save and all your work will be saved. The, st the statement will re remain in a suspended format, still saying to verify, and you will not have lost any of your work. Okay? Do we have any other questions about this step? Let's look in the chat. Maybe unmute everybody. So you can see that the statement above is, there is one more thing, Jason, I'd like to show about how we read the description in the activity type. Because we, we heard from accountants that it wasn't enough to recognize the name of the activity, but depending on the activity type, there'll be more information in the description. So over time, we've built institutional specific code about how activities get recognized. So if we look at the, this activity on the left-hand side, Okay, it says we've recognized it as a reinvestment, even though the activity type said dividend. Once we look at the description, we're able to recognize even more precisely what this activity type is. So this is to say that we've built institution-specific code for every institution that we've loaded into our application to be sure that we're reading all the information and to save you the most amount of time when you're doing this work. Okay. Once you're comfortable with the validation step here on the left, okay, you're ready to push data into the application. And we, it's a word that I like to bring up at this time is, you know, we're going to save you a lot of time on, on the manual data entry uh, uh, component of doing this work. But it is important as accountants to review the data before you push it 
into the application. So typically the, the profile that work of folks who work in our application are people who have experience with marketable securities. That's that's the best practice for, for accounting firms. So we have a question here that says, can you convert uh, mid-year? I'm not sure I understand that. Jeremy, can you elaborate on your question just a little bit? I believe the question is, is if you are working through a current process and you decide to invest in your tool, can you take and the numbers uh, mid-year point, enter those as open and balances and then continue on with the processes built into the software? There's nothing wrong with that. If you mean if you're shifting from one, uh, one a different software to ours in the middle of a reconciliation period, there's no issues with that, but we always recommend starting at the you know, with our process starting with the last month of the previous fiscal year so that you have opening balances that reconcile back to whatever alternate software you were using before. Now, if you start mid-year, your opening balances should still reconcile to the quote-unquote closing balances in whatever software you're using when you decide to cut it off. You're just limiting the amount of back data that you have in that client's portfolio hence limiting the amount of information you can report on in terms of a full fiscal year. And that's probably the key point there, Jeremy, is that if you're doing, if you wanted to, it wouldn't be an issue if you were just doing an end of year reconciliation, but you would be limited to uh, looking at months of activity related to only the months that were placed in our application. And I think that I'll probably come forward more when you show the reporting screens and the integration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Moving right along. Yeah, the, the data has all been verified. You see all the accounts that were verified are there. And now we're ready to close and our screen will automatically refresh with all of the data that has been brought into it in this particular month. You see the account tabs have been created at the top. If you have clients that have assets under management at more than one financial institution, you're able to bring all the data into one view in the application. Each time you load a statement that has a new uh, account number, it will be recognized and it will add it to the field there. We have some clients that have upwards of 60 accounts all linked to the same portfolio. Okay? so. If that was the case, you could rename the tabs. Let's say you wanted to name them by institution. Uh, you could call one of them uh, CIBC, another one of them uh, TD, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a way to manage that within the application. Okay. Now, we talked about bringing data in from different sources to create a full year and what that looks like. We're going to quickly tell it, take you into an account that has uh, data, and then we'll come back here. Sure. Okay. We'll show you what that looks like. So here we have an example of an account where a client has assets under management at multiple institutions. Everything is linked into one place in the portfolio. If we go to their uh, Manage Accounts and Uploads hub, you can see that we are bringing in data on a daily basis from TD and CIBC. The last scrape was last Friday that we brought data into the application in the morning, and the next one will be tomorrow morning to get all of the latest transactions. To backdate or to backfill to the beginning of the fiscal year, we have uh, the statements that were loaded. If we go into this account and we look at the notes and documents section, we also see that we're fetching the PDF statements every month and attaching them to the client's file, okay? So that's what an account looks like with multiple data sources being brought into it. We're gonna go back to our other account and we're gonna quickly show you one step called modifying of book values. So as we said, it's important to modify or validate all of the securities in the application. You're able to do this for Canadian and US securities. We bring up our book value edit window, okay? We change the book value at the moment in time when the application is seeing the security 
for the first time. We modify it and we process the data. The note, which is uh, part of the audit trail, is, is automatically created, and there you can add any content that you would like. Okay. And this is permanently attached to this file, so you have that full audit trail that I, I mentioned before. And the running book value, the running number of units, everything has been modified to reflect the change, which all those values were zeroed out before. Okay. Let's do a U.S. security now and show you how we would do that with the exchange rate. Same story, this time we have another window. We'll modify the book value for the security. And there we have the change along with the uh, effective exchange rate that we're calculating. So that's easy to put an exchange rate, a historical exchange rate for a security your client may be holding for 10 or 15 years you're able to put in the exact cost basis for the security in the application. All right. So moving right along, we're gonna let's see if there are any questions about that section. Are there any, anything else that came up? No. Okay. Let's move towards the last section of reporting. We're going to take you into an account where all of the, the data has been validated for Canadian and U.S. securities. Okay, so you have all the statements have been verified by the client. All the cost basis for the securities have been uh, modified. All the underlying activities have been linked properly to their securities. And all things have been validated so there's a full year's worth of data to be able to show the power of our reporting okay in our first screen we have a comprehensive library of reports now this is where we give you full control and your ability to create any type of report that you want based on your needs but we've also built some standardized reports based on uh, what we see are the most common reports that accountants are asking for. But the library is quite comprehensive, and not to forget that our roots are in wealth management. So if you're providing some ROR or IRR reporting to your clients, you can also uh, take advantage of those features in our application. Okay? So let's go into the uh, typical reports. We have a realized gain and loss. We have a realized income and we have the dreaded P1135 for an asset report. Okay. And this is automatically generated in our application. You no longer have to do this uh, on your own. Okay. So if we put in the date and the currency that we want to see the report in, we're able to generate them uh, with those specific criteria. Notice that next to each one of those, it says export. Since accountants still love to work with Excel, we've also created the Excel versions of the reports we're about to show you in PDF. And uh, you can generate them with all the embedded formulas in them. Okay. Now we're going to show you a PDF packet of the reports. And let's go through them. So that all the reports are organized by security. Okay. And what we have here is, uh, by, and by activity, what we have is uh, an ability to, to calculate your gain or loss on price and on currency. Okay, so this is very important to note. In the example that we often give, a client and the PIMCO income fund may have lost money on uh, quantity on the price of the security but on the currency they actually had a significant gain so we're able to track that okay in our next report also organized uh, by security with all the, the totals there um, everything is is uh, tabulated for you so it's easy to to uh, to track and it's all done by uh, by security with your totals there 
Okay. The foreign asset report, we track your maximum book value and the date, okay, for the, the maximum value so that this is easily recordable and you can actually attach this to your uh, CRA report. Okay, all the values are there. All right. We also have built a summary report. Okay into the application and this is basically your summary your uh, continuity report uh, your broker write-up report all right again we're going to show it in the uh, for the date range that is appropriate to this file and you're able to look at it in your local currency uh, if you so choose or generate it in the currency of the account uh, as, as needed. We know that oftentimes you want to see the reports all in USD, you can generate it that way, or in CAD with the exchange rates as well. So what you're looking at now is a reconciliation of every position and every transaction in the portfolio over the requested time frame. If we use the Bank of America bond here at the top of the report as an example, we provide the opening balance at cost, as well as the closing balance at cost on a security by security basis. In between the opening and closing balances are all the relevant transactions linked to that position incurred during the period, and they're all categorized by income, credit, or debit category. The same process is repeated security by security throughout the entire portfolio. At the bottom of our report, you have a reconciliation again of the gains and losses incurred, identical to what we displayed in the PDF report earlier, as well as a summary of asset transfer transactions, so you can reconcile to other bank accounts or other brokerage accounts uh, within or outside of the same portfolio. All of this information gets translated into this summary table, where we compare the opening total cost of cash and securities to the closing total cost of cash and securities. Presumably, the person responsible for entering data into our application has correctly followed our steps and started with the last month of the previous fiscal year and adjusted their book values and properly configured all the transactions. If that's the case, your opening balances plus the net sum of all your changes should be equal to your closing balances, in which case your discrepancy will be equal to zero. If that's not the case, we have all of the formulas embedded directly in the table, so you can actually trace back and find your source of error. And once your balancing uh, checks are complete, you can use all of the information in this table to record your journal entries directly into QuickBooks Online with a small linking process that needs to be set up in order to link your client's artifacts portfolio with their QuickBooks Online portfolio as well. We would have liked to show you specifically how we do that today, but we've just updated this spreadsheet to include a bunch of new lines, which means we have to update our API, uh, and we are, uh, I was hoping it would be ready for today, but uh, it seems we're still a couple of days away from uh, getting that API updated. But as Jason said, the process is fairly straightforward. Uh, there is uh, a link in our application. If you go into the application, you're able to go to uh, you're able to go to the client's portfolio, and we'll show you. I think this one is already linked to QuickBooks Online. Uh, no, this one might not be linked, but the button is. Oh, this one is linked. Off. So you see, this one is already linked to QuickBooks Online, so you'd be able to uh, post the journal entries with one step before, which is to make sure that you validate each of the values into each of the uh, columns, the categories for the chart of accounts for your client. Okay. There's a uh, question. How do you deal with distributions from trusts? When do you know when you don't know the tax nature of the distribution until Q3 received in March? Okay, to answer that question, which comes up in almost every presentation that we do, um, it depends on what's coming in from your data source. So most statements and most uh, web portals will show income from trusts and mutual funds either as dividends 
which would then be configured and fall under the dividend category, or distributions, which you can configure as a distribution, and it would fall under its own respective category, which is also referred to as, quote unquote, uh, deferred income. At that point in time, or even on our Excel reconciliation sheet, you have the ability to move values from one category to another. So if a security is actually paying a dividend and the value falls in the dividend category, but you know that it's going to be reconciled on a T3 document later in the year, you can actually move the value from one column over to the distribution section and have that recalculate automatically at the bottom of the sheet in the summary table. Once the T3s are received, we have the tools in place so that you can make the necessary adjustments and debit your dividend category or your distribution category and reallocate the values to the appropriate alternate income sources, be it return of capital, dividends, interest, capital gains, etc. More questions. Maybe we should unmute the mic and see if anybody wants to pipe in uh, sure. live. Okay, all participants have been unmuted. Can I, uh, so you're at the point now in this presentation where you can import into QuickBooks Online. Uh, you're mentioning you're making a couple additions to the APIs because the changes in the program that should be done any day. Uh, are you able to demonstrate an example how that works or with what you have right now? Jeremy, unfortunately, the answer is no, because uh, we because of the way the yeah. the uh, pointing the link works. J Jason just explained to me it will it will. Uh, this is the web base, right? Web -based. We won't be able to point to it. Sorry, I overheard a question in the background. I think somebody's question was, uh, it says post to QuickBooks Online. Uh, does it also post to QuickBooks Desktop? No, no, only to QuickBooks Online. But you could make the journal entry off the information there quite easily. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you get, and I think you showed it at the beginning, for one of my clients has uh, multiple brokerage accounts and I in a spreadsheet each month I uh, put them in columns so she can see how much security she owns in aggregate um, because it may be held in multiple accounts is that up on one of your standard reports yes absolutely so first of all in our main portfolio view which you're looking at right now if I were to use uh, Honeywell as an example right here mid-screen yeah. You can see that there are two separate positions being held in two separate accounts within the consolidated portfolio, each with their own respective cost base values. And then your uh, weighted average cost is automatically tabulated across the consolidated portfolio for each security. So if your client wanted to see their overall holdings, you could go into the report menu, generate what we refer to as a position report, and you can choose for the consolidated portfolio or by individual account, and then present your client with that information. Excellent. More questions. When I went on my TD Waterhouse account, I could not see a download function. Web so broker. When you went on to your T, so what? So what's the the specific question? Well, you're you're saying that we can create an automatic feed from our brokerage accounts. I don't see that. Okay, so the, or is it done from the software side, not from the brokerage it's side? That, it's from our software side. We've built a an encrypted read-only interface. So we'll show you quickly what you would do to do that. All right. Uh, Add an upload. We go to TD Water to TD Web Broker. Okay. 
we choose the, the web broker, we'd say validate website. So this is what your interface looks like, just yeah. to be sure that it's the same one. Okay, we know yeah. that that's it, we close yeah. it out. And then in our application, you click create. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and this is where you'd enter your credentials. Yeah. Okay. And it would be saved there. The password uh, is obviously hidden. The, the, uh, any security questions you have, where did I meet my wife and what was my first car, would all pop up here and you'd have to answer them. And in the case of TD Waterhouse, TD, there's a two-factor authentication, which we've also coded for. So that would come up and you'd have to enter the extra information at that step there. Then we would begin to download all of the activities from your, from your uh, website. Okay, so you're you're scraping data, not not directly accessing. No, we're scraping it exactly. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we could do it direct? Okay, yeah, understood. Well, yeah, I got it. Yeah, it would be nice, but the but the banks don't often cooperate with that part. Yeah. We have another question here. What type of security features in place? Is there a two-factor authentication? So. Uh, in our application, first of all, our application is hosted on a private network in Montreal. Uh, so it is a web-based application. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, in terms of security, we have regular penetration tests. We use the latest uh, encryption uh, technologies with the latest uh, encryption keys. And our network has also been uh, uh, validated by uh, enterprise-level firms uh, we're working with Deloitte and BDO at this time, so we had to pass all kinds of the security-related uh, aspects to uh, to the application for our application to be embedded, so that they would work with us. With Deloitte, we implemented single sign-on and a multi-factor authentication, so the capabilities are there if it's required. Uh, we have another question: Is will the program attract superficial losses? The answer is no. Uh, you can deal with them if you know that the client has uh, executed uh, a sale and then uh, taken it back. You are able to adjust for that in the application. So the answer is kind of. Thank you very much. No. Okay. Oh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, I see a question from Marla. What happens if there are corrections required to the original data upload entry? All of the data is adjustable and modifiable at any point in time. So, for example, for this portfolio, if I need to adjust any data point at any time, you have access to the full transaction log on an account-by-account -account basis. You can single out any individual account. There's a modify button always available. It will display all of the parameters related to this single this entry. Powerful, you can make... You can make adjustments to this single transaction. You can actually adjust the treatment type of this one activity without affecting all the others that belong to the same category. And then you can process those changes and it will force a recalculation within your portfolio. Do they like have a year end closing? So not go back to change your things. Yeah. Otherwise they will affect the beginning balance. Right? More questions. <clears throat> okay. I'm gonna put up my contact information uh, for people to uh, follow up if there's additional questions uh, that you'd like to ask directly if you want to see another a demonstration with some other colleagues at your firm uh, or for any kind of follow-up uh, here's my my contact information on the screen okay and um, if there aren't any questions I think we're we're ready to let everybody get back to their work uh, Jeremy do you, do you have some closing words yeah uh, thank you again uh, guy for doing this um, we greatly appreciate it as I mentioned um, uh, in my travels and interviewing firms, they uh, indicated that this was something that they couldn't solve for. So I would actually like to ask, is anybody in the group uh, willing to take guesses on uh, from what they've seen, how much time they can save um, throughout their day, year, quarter? 
Uh, a lot of this information, honestly, is uh, French to me because it's not an area that I um, particularly um, invest all my time into. But anybody want to comment on about what they see here and uh, what effects it has on their business? I can easily see it saving 50 to 75% when you're doing this. I mean, this is heavy data entry stuff with lots of mistakes and lots of inconsistencies when people are doing it. So maybe still advantage. And just to uh, reinforce that point, you know, I didn't talk about it. I, I usually do mention the getting rid of the, the errors. You know, you can imagine if somebody's working on a file, you know, 12 months worth of data on a client account that's got maybe three or four accounts uh, with uh, a moderate amount of uh, activity uh, and you're keying in all of those entries, you're bound to make mistakes. It's, it's uh, as we say, only human. So uh, there is an opportunity to virtually eliminate those errors because you're moving from a, a data entry a methodology to a data conversion and recognition methodology. So your, your process is then to review. So thank you, Ray, for bringing that up because it's a really important point. And it certainly does contribute to the time savings overall that's associated with using our application. So, uh, let, me, let me just emphasize that even further, because I just finished doing it for one of my, my December clients that we, we finish off their tax return in February. So in May, um, I now need to reconcile the tax information. And what's interesting about it is, you know, Months of the year, the distribution is called dividends. Uh, two months that we put in return of capital, and three months of in interest. And you know, so I've got to re-audit all of last year's information because it's all inconsistent. So um, just having it in one place would help a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. We do hear we do hear about that, and we're. In terms of where we're going next, I think maybe I could just talk about that for a second. We're, we're constantly working on automation and recognition. So this is uh, key areas for us. There is uh, some additional reporting that, that we'll be building. And our, our uh, process is really very collaborative with our clients. Chances are if there's something, I know it's a bit cliche to say, but if there's something that's in the good of one client, Typically, it's in the good of all clients. So we are a software company. Uh, from a product development point of view, we're always looking to see how we can make it better and respond even more. It's how we got here. And a little anecdotal story is when we first started showing the technology to accounting firms, we didn't have a running cash balance. We didn't have a continuity report. Flashback three years, and accounting kept saying to us, well, you know, you need to add all these things. And we said, we're not building investment accounting software. Well, guess what? We built investment accounting software because that was the only way accountants would use the application if it really mirrored their business uh, process. So how do we get data in? How do we modify and adjust all the data? And then how do we report on it in a way that we're used to? Uh, so we really, we really focused on that. And we, you know, we're always open to uh, how we can improve the application even further. So okay. The question nobody's asked, we've talked about the time saving is cost. Yeah, so, uh, you know, our fees are structured, uh, you know, we have, we have an upfront uh, engagement and training fee, which is uh, done on a one-off basis. Uh, there's no annual recurring maintenance fees. No, uh, there's no additional fees associated with uh, adding any financial institutions that we don't recognize today, either for conversion. Like I said, that's a one-off fee, which also includes ongoing uh, customer support uh, via email or screen share. And then we have a monthly fee uh, for the entities. On That that uh, first fee is, is varies depending on the size of the firm and how many entities you're going to place in the application. And monthly fee is, uh, is uh, um, uh, based on the uh, entity with an unlimited number of accounts or uh, so what do we call it? Uh, so a financial institution's assets under management. So if a client has assets at two or three different institutions, it's still uh, $25 a month in the application. More questions? All right, 
Jeremy, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap it up there. Give it a five, four, three, two, one. Uh, thanks again, Artifacts, for doing this demonstration. Uh, I think this is just a prime example of how the Intuit Business Development Team, working along with our accountant partners, um, you know, meeting your needs. Um, you let us know what you need in your business. Intuit might not necessarily be the uh, producer of that product that uh, fulfills those needs, but we have this wonderful ecosystem of partners that we can introduce you to to help you get your work done as well. So um, I will be taking a recording in this, uh, posting it up on my YouTube uh, channel.